A very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, this webinar is uh, something that we've planned for, we're very excited about, and we're tremendously proud to have the uh, speakers that we have today. Um, we are continuing the webinar series today, and then at the end of the session, I'll remind you that we have a couple of more webinars coming up next year uh, in the first part of the year to complete our uh, anniversary celebrations. Um, today we are truly giving a, uh, an international or global perspective and the subject is the session will focus on the topic of advocating for the rights of unpaid carers. So a very important issue and I'm, I'm not sure whether all of you knew but many of us did that yesterday the 19th of October we celebrated Carers Day for the first time across India, Nepal and Bangladesh. So this is a perfect timing for this particular session. I have to say that um, the celebrations have gone incredibly well, very colorful demonstrations and uh, a whole lot of uh, 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 different events and sessions taking place, wonderful. Um, we have a number of speakers. Uh, so uh, Anil will first of all be talking with uh, Emma uh, Chaniaski. She is the CEO of UK for UNHCR. She's the founding CEO of U UK for UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency's national charity partner here in the UK. Emma has more than 20 years of experience in fundraising and senior management in the nonprofit sector and in politics, including significant roles in the International Crisis Group, Human Rights Watch, and the Liberal Democrats. Uh, Stacy Yeganemos, uh, talking to us from Belgium, um, is uh, the executive director of Eurocarers, the European network representing informal carers and their organizations. He is a policy, advocacy and communication specialist with extensive experience in international advocacy activities. He has worked with Anil and Carers Worldwide on, a, on various global advocacy activities through the International Association of Carer Organizations, of which uh, Euro Carers and Carers Worldwide are both members. From Nepal, we welcome uh, Bimal Lal Shrestra. Bimal Ji is the CEO of Self-Help Group for, for Cerebral Palsy in Nepal, partner organization of Carers Worldwide since 2016. Uh, the initials for it are SGCP, which is dedicated to improving the lives of children and adults with cerebral palsy, and is committed to including carers into its programs. As a result, the Nawa Agawan Samaj Carers Association was set up in 2019, and Bimalji will be telling us more about its development and achievements later. Natesh is carers worldwide India's project coordinator and works with our 12 partner organization and carer associations across five states of India, guiding and supporting them to work together on advocacy actions with local and state government. He'll be sharing more of this work later in the webinar. And we mustn't forget him, Anil himself, of course, our founder, uh, Anil Patil is our founder and um, our chief executive and is the person who will be front and center of these discussions, along with uh, all of these guests who are very, very welcome today. Uh, first of all, we'll invite Anil to conduct individual interviews with Emma and Stacy, and then uh, we'll invite, and then he will be inviting uh, Bimal and uh, Natesh to describe their experiences uh, as we go forward. As you will have realized already, we are uh, welcoming people from the UK, from Belgium, from Nepal, and India. In fact, Anil himself is in India at the moment. Finally, we'll finish with a few questions and answers. Ruth and Michelle are behind the scenes monitoring the chat box uh, and we would encourage all of you, if you can, and if you have the um, if you have the uh, internet to keep your videos on, uh, that would be helpful. And if you can put questions in the chat box to everyone, that will uh, help to enliven the uh, session and keep it going. With no further ado, Anil, 
let me ask you to come in now and begin your interview with Emma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Um, uh, greetings to everybody from uh, Chennai. I just arrived uh, from uh, Bangladesh after an incredible, uh, inspiring day yesterday. Um, so good to see you all. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, Emma, I just want to straight away go into a question. Uh, can you just share what makes effective advocacy for? Who should be involved? How do you shape uh, what you advocate for? And uh, what ask are likely to gain attraction? Sorry, there is a lot of questions <laughs> in one sentence. I, I hope you'll be able to capture all those things. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you so much uh, to Keros Worldwide for inviting me to, to join today. I think the, the first thing to say um, is that support for carers is a human rights issue. And I think that framing it in this way is, is very effective and very important because it's the human stories that are remembered and that inspire. And I think it's the fight for rights that will gain traction with policymakers. So that's just a, a very basic but, but fundamental thing that should be at the heart of everything that you do. And I think it's it's wonderful to see that you're building a long-term and global movement and that you have this vision and aspiration um, and to raise awareness around the lives of carers and how, how critical they are for their families and their communities. Um, yesterday, the, the initiative that, that you've taken to build a Carers Day from the ground up um, with the, the celebration um, that you had I think it is a really great start. And um, particularly highlighting that you're, you included a call to action um, and uh, sort of there was a way for the public to be involved and for obviously your, your carers to be involved. But you also had an advocacy component um, that was directed to national policymakers and local authorities. And I think always keep, keeping that twin track in mind, the public, the policymakers, is extremely important. Of course, the two go together, but you always need to have those working hand in hand. Um, I think it's interesting to reflect that sometimes um, an advocacy campaign can have a positive message, as in together with refugees, for example, which is a coalition here in the UK around the rights of refugees. And sometimes it can be around a stop the something. So it can be stop the use of child soldiers or ban landmines. And so I think this question around what are your key messages and how are you gonna expand awareness around them? Which messages are you tailoring to which audience? And just making sure that everything that, in everything that you do, that you communicate, that you engage, you, you have that message discipline and that purpose discipline, I think is really, really important. Um, I think, you know, outside of messaging and, and traditional sort of media, um, some of the other important elements of, of advocacy are, you know, very clear policy objectives and, and policy makers that you are aspiring to reach, um, having a stakeholder map. So who are you, you know, within policy uh, world, but also perhaps with journalists, perhaps with influencers, perhaps with um, global international diplomats, if you're looking to do something on the global stage, who are those stakeholders that you're trying to reach and, and trying to, to map that out very deliberately. Um, coalition building, obviously very important, something that you're already doing. And I think particularly at a time where sometimes governments can be resistant or just very busy and not prioritizing your cause, then um, using the power of coalitions and storytelling and you know, building that movement from the grassroots is really the way to build up the power and the, the, um, the impact of your campaigns. Great, great, uh, Emma. Uh, you made a very powerful statement that uh, carers' uh, issue is a human rights issue and their lives matter. 
uh, such a powerful uh, statement. Of course, we do believe in that. Could you give us a, a couple of examples of an effective campaign, share a practical example, uh, if you have some, that would be great. Um, so some, some years ago, uh, I worked for Human Rights Watch, the International Human Rights Organization, and um, I was working for them in California, and we identified there that um, there were uh, a significant number of um, young people who had been imprisoned uh, for life without parole. Um, and so even though they had been under the age of 18 at the time that they had committed their offense, they had been sentenced to life in prison without any possibility of parole. And we felt this was a fundamental human rights issue um, and that young people, people under 18 should always be given a second chance. Um, as you can imagine, it, it was quite a challenging um, issue because law and order and law enforcement in the U.S. is, is so quite, there's quite a conservative approach. And uh, we were advocating for the rights of people who had committed quite serious offenses and, and serious crimes. So it was a very much of a long-term effort. And actually it took seven years to get the change that we were looking for in um, the, the legislation that would ban the use of that sentence, life without parole, um, and restrict it to people who were over 18 at the time they committed their crime. And it was, um, so for me, the key lessons were um, patience, um, and again, you know, seven years, um, timing that we had to wait for the right makeup in the state legislature to see that that happen. So sometimes you're lying in wait for the right moment. So having that timing is incredibly important. And I think um, what was really significant about that campaign for Human Rights Watch is that there, there are obviously 50 states in, in the US. And once we, we had that precedent in California, we were able to work with other organizations to, to then look for other states to overturn the same, you know, and have the same legislation. So I think that model also that, that you are where you are starting in India at the state level, and then hopefully that that will you will be able to build that out in the future with other states, you know, following the, those same, um, you know, policies, uh, you know, laws um, and matters of practice. I think you know that it's extremely important always to try to build up in that way because something sometimes achieving something at the national level isn't possible. So you have to start at the state level. Um, yeah, no, and, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Absolutely, no, no. Emma, uh, you are absolutely right. My colleague will share about the state levels. Uh, uh, exactly the point what you. Uh, shared with us about the example, having that patience and uh, finding the right time to you know, engage with the different stakeholders. I just want to, uh, last one minute, I want to ask you, you know, uh, last couple of years, so social media is playing a huge, huge role in terms of uh, advocacy. Could you please share your knowledge and uh, experience of uh, advocacy using social media? So uh, my, uh, Current charity, UK for you and HCR, our, our mission is to engage the UK public around um, international refugee crises. And we worked on a campaign last year um, to create something called a refugee dictionary, which was for every, every any member of the public could contribute a one word definition, uh, a refugee is dot, dot, dot. And we received hundreds um, uh, of those, uh, you know, definitions and, and stories, really, they were little tiny stories. And I think that when you are um, on the social media channels, giving people something to be able to participate in and storytell um, it is incredibly effective. And we were really actually surprised by the, 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 the breadth of the response, but also that we had some really um, sort of influential and, and high profile uh, people who, who chose to, to contribute a definition. So the Archbishop of Canterbury and um, you know, some well-known actors and some well-known activists. And we built this up into a, a book that is now you know, um, kind of a, a permanent record. And I think, so this idea um, in, your, in your campaigns, to try to um, engage the public in sharing their experiences um, and then creating something that reflects all of that can be a really effective way 
of, I think, getting people to engage with you in social media beyond just retweeting or, you know, um, it's actually something that can you can get create something permanent out of that engagement. Wonderful, uh, uh, Yama. Uh, I think uh, you have given a lot of food for thoughts on us, uh, uh, particularly using the social media. I'm sure my colleagues uh, will be thinking something to run on a similar campaign. I got some ideas as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, sharing your uh, wisdom and knowledge and practical uh, uh, examples of that. You talked about the uh, issue of carers is a human rights issue, their life matters, uh, as well as uh, in terms of uh, some practical tips, being patient and uh, finding the right time for that and how important it is to engage different stakeholders using the social media. Thank you so much. Um, I would you, like Neil. to uh, uh, go to Stacy now. Uh, is a very dear friend and a carer champion and a great leader, inspiring leader in uh, Europe, particularly uh, they use the word informal carers. We use the word unpaid family carers. So we both are the uh, same. Um, Stacy, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and sharing your uh, experience and wisdom and knowledge and uh, learnings. So uh, let me go straight into you. Euro carers has achieved great, great deal, particularly in the policy arena. And you support all of your members organization to advocate for various issues of informal carers and unpaid family carers. Why, why do you have chosen this focus and why is it important? It means Euro carers have chosen this uh, issue. Thank you, Anil. Good afternoon. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm, I must say I'm delighted, even though we focus obviously on, on Europe, uh, I'm delighted to be part of this conversation because ultimately, the things we're pushing for, I think, uh, you know, concern everyone across the world. So it's great that uh, we are able to team up and exchange uh, information and practice. Uh, look, the way uh, our work is structured, um, it is based on the idea that ultimately um, the challenges facing informal care carers, so we, won't, we say informal carers indeed, but you say unpaid family carers, it's the same thing. Um, they do not only concern or they do not boil down to the interaction of informal carers with care professionals or the way informal carers are able to provide good quality care to the person they care for. The, the, the experience, the daily experience of uh, informal carers across the world, um, you know, there are many dimensions to it. So it, it is indeed about long-term care, but it's also about gender equality, it's about work-life balance, it's, it's about access to good quality information and training, it's about youth, uh, young carers, it's about the future of, of, of care and caring, it's about universal access to so human rights. So there are many, many dimensions. And so the way we defined our own advocacy strategy for the whole network is to try and explore as many of these dimensions and document as many of these di dimensions as possible in order really to expand the target audience um, you know, before us. And obviously when I say target audience, I mean primarily decision makers or policy makers. If you only focus on long-term care, you will only be able to convince those who are involved in those decisions. But if you diversify and you are able to develop convincing arguments in all of the topics I just mentioned and more, uh, then you create a critical mass of policymakers who will suddenly help you connect the dots and develop a more, let's say, transversal or, or multi-dimensional approach to the topic. And I think that's really what we need to make a difference. Uh, and so indeed, uh, that you know, essentially explains um, the philosophy behind our advocacy strategy uh, in, in our network, yeah. Great, great, uh, Stacey. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, uh, knowledge and experience you were able to share with us uh, uh, and to the audience uh, virtually here. Could you uh, tell us a little bit uh, more about a uh, few of your advocacy gains recently? I know uh, you had this wonderful uh, uh, gain recently. Uh, I would like you to share that rather than me. 
opening. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. with pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm, you'll excuse me, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do uh, to say this before saying a few words sure. about the, the history of the organization. So, Eurocares was actually created in in 2006, but but actually up until 2014. Uh, you know, it was essentially a group of voluntary organizations who would have a meeting here and there to, you know, coordinate, but there was no real structure. And then there was a bit of a turning point in 2014 because the commission um, started to realize that long-term care was a key challenge, uh, also uh, an economic challenge uh, for the union. And, and so they were, and, and also that informal care is an important piece of the puzzle. And so they were looking for a, an adequate interlocutor to discuss what should be done to, you know, integrate somehow the, the questions relating to informal care in the decision-making process. There again, the natural entry point was long-term care. So basically we signed uh, a partnership agreement with the European Commission, which obviously, as you can imagine, was great because that means we had an open door now. Um, and we were able to, uh, to advise, um, you know, the commission on, on all sorts of issues. So the focus was on long-term care and already then we were pushing for a, a strategy on carers. So something that would try and, and, um, and address the many dimensions I was telling you about. But then uh, at that stage, the commission said, look, I mean, the reality is we are struggling to convince member states to focus on long-term care generally. So what you should, you know, what we expect you to do really is to help us convince member states. So we had to start there and then, as I said, gradually expand. Uh, so we focused primarily on long-term care, then we started to focus on human rights, and then we started to focus on informal care as a barrier to employment, and then female employment, and then by extension, gender inequalities. And so step by step, you know, yeah, more and more people were listening to us not only among decision makers, not only at EU level, but also through our member organizations at national regional level. And so the first political gain um, arrived, um, well, it arrived, I think in 2017, uh, the, the you know, very first one, when all member states decided that it made sense to have a coordinated uh, approach um, towards care and caring, long-term care at open level, and then as a follow-up in 2019, there was a, a directive, I mean, this is EU jargon, but essentially recommendations to member states by the commission on, on measures and policies that should be put in place regarding work-life balance for parents and carers. And as part of this, we did manage to uh, have the idea of a carer's leave uh, included, which was completely new, uh, you know, uh, at European level. So that, that was a second big gain. And then once we managed to push that door, many different things happened. There was the child rights strategy mentioned young carers, the gender equality strategy mentioned, mentioned young carers. And then most recently, to connect all of these dots, the commission a few weeks ago released an EU care strategy focusing on both professional long-term care and informal care. So it took a few, you know, uh, quite a few steps, <laughs> but now we are here. Um, this is not the end of the story, obviously. Uh, you know, this, the, the strategy is only an, an, an instrument. It's, it's a great instrument, but it's only an instrument. It now needs to be uh, implemented across uh, Europe, but at least we have a, an amazing platform uh, you know, to convey our message. Great, Stacey. Uh, I congratulate on this latest uh, gains and uh, really well deserved that and uh, your leadership and all the member state. Uh, so we can learn quite a lot from uh, you. Um, so my final question to you is, uh, can you share with the, what are the top three practical tips uh, for uh, us to be a successful uh, advocate? for advocacy. Yeah, I mean, really to sum up what I, what I just said, if I was to try and, you know, uh, you know, put it in a very, very concise way, I would focus on, on, you know, in my view, four key principles. 
The first one is identify your audience, your target audience. Now, it sounds like, you know, I'm pushing at an open door, but I mean, don't stick to the natural comfort zone. Uh, don't stick to, you know, people dealing with long-term care, for example. You know, try and identify all of the people who need to be on your side to actually make a difference for, for carers in your region. The second thing is um, learn to speak their language. So, um, you know, there's a lot of jargon in the policymaking arena, uh, certainly even more at EU level, I can tell you. Learn that language because it sounds like we're speaking different languages, but actually once you, you know, explore the jargon, you realize actually there are many commonalities. So if you approach someone, a policymaker, and say, oh, you know, we need to do something about the human rights of informal carers, maybe they'll say, I have no, you know, I understand what you're trying to achieve, but I have no time for this. But then in our case, everyone was speaking when we started the interaction with the commission, everyone was speaking about social investment. And social investment is essentially about investing in the human potential of people. Now use if, and then we started to approach policymakers and say, well, actually we need to, you know, create social investment in the field of informal care for these reasons. And then suddenly people were listening. So we were saying exactly the same thing with different words and then people started to listen. The third one is um, do the homework. Uh, so, you know, uh, explore, uh, come up with new arguments, be creative, uh, again, to be able to, to speak to whoever you have uh, across the table. You know, again, it doesn't mean change your message. It, it means find different ways of saying the same things. And then the last one is probably the most important one, repeat, <laughs> repeat the whole process. We live in a never changing environment and policy environment. We deal with people who are elected for three, four years, and then they change. You know, they want to see um, easy, easy solutions, easy, you know, uh, things that they can easily promote after that as uh, you know, they need easy wins is what I mean, I suppose, you know, policymakers. So help them and then become their, um, you know, ally. And then if they see you as an ally, they will help you. Uh, yeah, so Great. that's the way I would. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing those uh, practical advocacy tips, uh, Stacey. There is a lot to learn from uh, you as well as Emma. Um, Great. Thank you so much for giving us uh, your valuable time and the insights today, sharing with uh, all of us. My pleasure. Um, so now uh, uh, I would like uh, uh, to request my colleague, uh, uh, Michelle, to share yesterday's this big day event. Uh, you know, she has put together in such a short period of time, with a short, short video, just to give a glimpse of different activities that uh, took place uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, also, uh, many of uh, carers and uh, dignitaries have signed to the carers uh, worldwide uh, carers charter and our partner organizations. And I would uh, request uh, all the uh, virtual participants here to uh, go on to our website. And there is a section on you can sign up and you can pledge or make a commitment to support carers. Um, over to you, Michelle. This is the first International Keras Day, and all the Keras from Sawar districts are here in Dhaka to celebrate uh, uh, Keras Day. It's a very happy occasion and memorable uh, day for everybody. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Bimalji to share uh, their experiences of uh, current uh, state of advocacy uh, work uh, with carers in Nepal. Over to you, Bimalji. Thank you, Anilji. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. And uh, happy carers day. Thank yeah. you. I am still yeah. uh, excited with the, what happened yesterday. Oh. <clears throat> uh, in a very short notice, the carers, a large group of carers, they gathered together and they gave a lot of, uh, uh, the, the traffic police has to manage, you know, the middle of the city all over. <clears throat> and uh, you can see the, the, the charter has been read and they have committed. <clears throat> and the uh, Keras issue is, uh, was realized a long time, but it has not been uh, structurally or in a very systematically has been uh, progressed. <clears throat> and uh, since Keras Worldwide joined us, then it became a very, uh, in a very structured way, very systematically way, it, it carried on. <clears throat> And uh, I just heard Ima say, you know, it is a human right issue. Mm. In Nepal, it is not yet been taken as a human right issue. If you go to the policymaker and anywhere, you know, they are unaware of this uh, issue at this at this stage. And uh, since the last uh, five years' work, it is <clears throat> instigating the. the even starting from parents, they even do not realize that they are important. Almost it took two years or even three years to realize that the carers are important. You have a right, so you have to do something. So that took almost three years. And that when that helped create an association, Nava Agaman, Samrakshak Samaj, now it has been realized. It is a small group, but they have realized very much. So <clears throat> the media or all other things uh, not yet effective at the moment because the concept is still at the infant stage. So the advocacy takes on face-to-face -face basis, you know. So uh, uh, our staff and the carers themselves, as last time last year. They went, went to municipalities and the different organization and they have sessions, you know, and uh, those who have joined these sessions have an open mouth. I mean, they're just uh, stunned, you know, but everybody has, uh, accepted. And it has done not only in the Kathmandu Valley, in the capital city, but also outside in districts, more than uh, 300, uh, local government officials join it, join this uh, advocacy uh, <clears throat> effort. So uh, at the moment we are uh, trying to have a face-to-face, -face. you know, even, even the carers, uh, definition of carers is not even been uh, realized. So <clears throat> uh, last year we, we did a, a lot of advocacy and the carers day were celebrated twice before and uh, despite of uh, covid you know for two years of uh, slackness <clears throat> our carers has become a very active and they realize it and uh, i tell you one thing that uh, <clears throat> yesterday after the um, the charter was read and the committee by standing everybody committed every uh, point of the uh, charter and uh, some of the carers joined together and they came to me that now uh, at the moment in Nepal we have an election in uh, three weeks time after that we will have a new government so the carers came to me and uh, we will go to the new government and uh, put our demand so this is this is a this is a very good one not only that <clears throat> this time, because of the short period, 
we we didn't have a much guest in the, in uh, yesterday, uh, but we vowed that uh, next in the next uh, Keras day there will be president of Nepal. We will we will uh, we will try for that, you know, and uh, it will be a big uh, advocacy as well. Yeah, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bimalji, uh, for uh, sharing such a uh, uh, practical and what you are able to, in spite of challenges and the difficulties, uh, this whole uh, idea of carers is a new concept and how much uh, carers association has taken up and not just making caring visible, but making others to aware of their issues, their challenges, their difficulties. And uh, it has been a fantastic journey and uh, how much they are empowered. Uh, this uh, whole Navagaman Samrakshak Samaj, uh, they have been a role model. I do remember recently when I was in Nepal uh, you know, with the uh, Navagaman Samrakshak visiting a local authorities yeah. and they were demanding for yes. uh, carers uh, 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 for the centers and uh, uh, to support the center and all. So uh, it has been wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Bimalji. Um, so I would like to uh, move to now uh, Natesh. Uh, he is a dear friend and uh, colleague uh, of ours. Sorry, there is somebody. One moment. Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anil, it's a funny time for Amazon to come. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered coffee two hours ago. <laughs> anyway, um, so over to you, Natesh. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, he will share some of the wonderful and terrific uh, uh, advocacy results we were able to see it behind the scenes and he has worked very hard with uh, uh, all our partners in India. Over to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Uh, as part of uh, uh, KRS Worldwide uh, module, uh, we have an, uh, one of the important uh, ele element is advocacy. I will share some of the uh, slides here. Then I can explain a uh, structured way. Uh, Carers Worldwide uh, Advocacy Work uh, in India. Uh, these are some of the uh, Carers uh, Association members. Uh, photos you can see, they are very you know, uh, empowered groups and uh, they are uh, advocating at different level. Uh, I will show the structure. We are very uh, strategically, there is a structure of uh, carers groups and starting from uh, village level to uh, then they are clubbing into the cluster level groups. And then from cluster level, the representative vote at the block level. Uh, they have their uh, committees and the association. From the block level, uh, uh, we can go, they are going to the district level. District level committees are there, associations are there. These associations, some of the uh, seven associations have been registered under the uh, regular uh, state uh, act and they've been part of the uh, system. And we have division level carers association. This is uh, informal. And uh, four, at present, we have four state level carers forum and we are going to form one more in a, a new year in Tamil Nadu. And these are the multi-stakeholder uh, committees uh, where we meet uh, regularly, quarterly once and uh, discuss the issues. And uh, in December, we are going to form the national level, India National Alliance for Care. Uh, this is the advocacy structures of uh, where the carers uh, comes together and uh, advocate at different level. I'll go one by one. Uh, what are the advocacy uh, work have been done by these uh, structures? Uh, this is the uh, uh, cluster level, where what we call uh, the local self-government, uh, gram panchayat level. At present, we have around the 700 carers groups are functioning and addressing their issues. Where these uh, groups are taking the uh, issues and uh, submitting the memorandums to access uh, various entitlement benefits from the local authorities. 
like for example uh, uh, in karnataka they are accessing the uh, 5% reserve fund for various uh, health and livelihood support and also recently government uh, some of the gram panchayat were uh, supporting for the carer alliance whatever the amount is available within their 5% uh, reserve fund a uh, carers are participating in the gram sabhas and ward ward sabha meeting where the decision taken for the selection of the beneficiaries is and they are raising their voice and accessing their job cards and jobs through the uh, job guarantee scheme under the national level programs and assessing their toilets and housing scheme and all these some of the groups in uh, different parts of the country uh, where we are working the groups are linked with the national schemes like national rural livelihood scheme where they can access uh, the financial support to take up the livelihood activities to improve their uh, economic situation uh, this is at the gram panchayat level that the groups are uh, doing the advocacy for different uh, issues when come to the block level this is the next higher level and uh, where are the larger issues will be taken up by the association member for example there are 30 block level carers uh, association have been there informally for example accessing the tri uh, psychiatric treatment and regular uh, medicines so has been successfully done and udid cards earlier used to have only one yearly one scam and very difficult to access the uh, unique disability identity card now the frequency of assessment and campaigning increased due to the uh, advocacy work from this uh, block level the groups are linked into the market to support like producers group to get the fair price for their products and care alliance started in urban local bodies also they are uh, providing the care alliance and uh, advocating for the established uh, day care centers or we what we call community care center where the children can be looked after and carers can re get respite and uh, go for the work uh, health insurances earlier uh, the difficult to access the health insurance because of the black level and now all these uh, most of the carers have been accessing the state level health insurance schemes uh, then at the next level there are the district level district level advocacy there are nine carers association have been registered and with the uh, existing society act or trust act they work uh, directly with the district authorities uh, different uh, issues have been uh, addressed so far uh, there is uh, carers have included in the district level uh, disability committee under the rpd act 2016 where they can raise their voice and discuss the issues and uh, get the benefits or entitlement from the government. And treatment, uh, general treatment and uh, medicines are made available to the carers. Uh, where are even outside, uh, if they provide the prescription from the private hospitals, the district hospital is able to buy those medicines and uh, give to the carers. And during the district uh, grievance, uh, Redressal meeting, uh, the discussion on carers' issues are started. Uh, carers are raising their issues and uh, addressing their issues. And uh, uh, carers' days may have been celebrated, even beginning from the project 2014, in collaboration with the district authorities, local authorities, and various stakeholders have involved uh, in this process to sensitize the issues of caregivers. And legal service authorities. Uh, this is a legal from the from the point of legal uh, service authorities have recognized the issues and concern and they will take up the issues and the supporting the carers to address their rights and entitlements there are programs uh, at the various state level programs national programs like rashtriya uh, balaswati karyakram district early intervention centers district mental health program district disability rehabilitation uh, council they are functioning to provide the rehab service to the children at the uh, early intervention stage where the children get not going to the secondary information. This is reducing the burden of the carers. So when the child will be uh, functionable, then carers have the time to do the other work. So these uh, programs are helping a lot in this. And come to the state level. Uh, 
we have a present work state level carers forum and uh, another this uh, next month we are going to sorry sorry natesh if we can just uh, quick summarize that not to go into each point just uh, yeah. uh, take a key one and uh, yeah thank you uh, state recognizes uh, the priorities in the carers during the covid vaccination and the carers module increase in the state level uh, program for the uh, training of the state level author uh, authorities on the carers module as carers worldwide uh, uh, recognized as a model uh, nodal organization in the karnataka state and uh, yesterday actually in the karnataka state the entire state a state disability department issued an order to celebrate carers day this is one of the important milestone and state government has recommended to the central government considering caring as a job so now the central it's uh, this is in the central government to come up with the considering caring as a job so these are and uh, we are proposing proposed to the state government to form the uh, carers group across the state e one carers group needs gram panchayat and uh, two three wards together carers group this will be a game changer and i think carers get recognition to raise their voice to improve their living conditions yeah thank you natesh uh, if you can quickly uh, yeah at national national level uh, there are the 11 national policy review have been done some of our recommendation are going to government is considering and implementing uh, in national seminars to disseminate information and best practices it helps to other stakeholders to do the same building alliance with other networks and also developing the national policy for the carers to concrete action for the implementation. And these are some of the photos from yesterday's uh, carers day across different parts of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natesh, for that incredible uh, advocacy work on the ground in India with uh, various uh, uh, level uh, from Gram Panchayat to uh, state level and national level uh, it is uh, fantastic and uh, we are really taking this learning to other countries like nepal as well as uh, bangladesh uh, thank you bimalji and thank you uh, natesh for you can close the uh, sharing your presentation uh, natesh um, for being with us and sharing your uh, uh, experiences uh, working on advocacy issue uh, at a uh, grassroots level uh, once again, thanks to uh, both of you. Uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. What a wonderful uh, uh, set of uh, speakers that we've had today. Incredible. Um, uh, so we are most grateful. Uh, a couple of questions have come up uh, straight away from the audience. Emma, here's one for you, if you don't mind. Uh, it comes from Emily Wade. And it's how can experiences from Europe and the UK benefit countries like India concerning caregivers advocacy? Would you like to have a go at that one, Emma? Well, it might be better um, if, uh, if, if Stacey had, had a go at that one, um, because I, I could give some sort of general um, thoughts about, um, oh, but, but it's probably you might be better placed than me to comment on on the, the caregivers advocacy particularly. Sure, um, uh, your humility is welcome <laughs> in, the, in the current political crisis. <laughs> um, uh, Stacy, please come in. Sure. Um, well, look, first of all, of all of these countries, UK, Germany, France, are at div different stages of development when it comes to the rights of informal carers. I mean, the UK on paper at least has different forms of support available to informal carers, even though, unfortunately, we know that in practice, you know, it's not as, as great as it looks on paper, but that's a different uh, discussion. Uh, France actually started only very recently. It's only, I think, three years ago that the government announced a big package, very ambitious package. Yeah, of, end of, of 2019. Yeah, yeah, there you go, on of measures. So that's still very much work in progress and as for germany germany is also you know making progress gradual progress 
but their focus at this stage is very much on working carers. So how to support uh, informal carers who have, um, you know, professional responsibility. So first of all, just to say that these countries, different stages, which also means that they started somewhere, which is from scratch, you know, at, at some point. So what you can learn from those countries is where, you know, did the movement start? What was the, again, the main entry point? Germany, you know, interesting, interestingly enough, work-life balance. Uh, I don't know exactly where the UK movement started, but when it comes to France, uh, it's the whole thing is about the aging of society. Um, you know, uh, France is one of the fast aging, fastest aging countries in Europe. Um, and so obviously that also has a weight um, on the election, the, the fact that more and more voters are, you know, reaching an old age. And the package, unsurprisingly, was released uh, around the election. So. Um, yeah, so the way these models can be applied in other parts of the world is, again, as part of the, the homework I was telling you about and, and uh, bearing in mind that these countries started, you know, from a, a point where there was pretty much nothing and then gradually everything was built up from the ground, you know. But yeah, thank you very much for this answer and we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I just uh, was wondering, uh, if this really apply, considering that um, um, the situation in uh, uh, India and Africa, for example, is uh, not the same, uh, especially about what you said, uh, the age of the population, the aging uh, population, and also um, the financial means and the medical system, because the pinpoint for uh, uh, France, uh, UK, and Germany uh, seems to be also the cost of uh, that caregivers uh, will have on the social security Thanks. system if they uh, decide you, to uh, give up on their responsibilities, which is not the situation for uh, India or Africa, I guess, because they don't have this uh, uh, or and as elaborate as uh, we have a, a social security system. Thank, so thank you, Emily. Because Let me get uh, Stacy to come in here. And uh, Stacy, if you'd like to just answer a little portion of that commentary, that would be helpful because we have other questions and we only have a few minutes left. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, sorry, Emily, and, and I completely agree with you. But I mean, again, more and more what we see, and that's also a result in a way of the EU care strategy that was launched uh, a few weeks ago, as I said. Um, there are two ways of approaching the economic dimension. You know, a few years ago, um, what the majority of policymakers were saying was indeed that if informal carers were to stop caring, our systems would collapse, right? And it, it yeah. is definitely true. Now, in, interestingly enough, what we see is that more and more decision makers are also saying, okay, that means informal care is a contribution to society, right? And so it should be treated as such, not only as a barrier to other money-making activities, but it should be treated as a contribution to society. And as attached to this contribution, we should probably develop rights as well and see, um, you know, make sure that basically informal care stems from choice and is not the default option for informal care. So again, it's, you know, it, it, it stems from the same basic message, which is the cost the economic value of informal care, but with different, you know, tiny nuances, but these nuances actually make a difference for carers. Thank you very much, both of you. That's really helpful and a very interesting discussion, which obviously can go further. Uh, Emma, you um, might like to have a look at this question relating to young carers um, from Andy McGowan. Uh, uh, thank you, Andy, for the question. With the development of the Commonwealth Charter for Young Carers and the European Care Strategy, as well as existing provisions such as UNH, UNC, UNCRC, how can we uh, help to ensure young carers are able to have their voices heard and able to bring about more change in more countries? Emma. Well, um, just speaking really to, to the UN uh, piece um, uh, specifically, uh, one of the things that UNHCR has done is establish a Young Champions Program which is a young, um, uh, obviously a, a program for, for young people to be ambassadors for the refugee cause um, in their individual countries. And uh, we, we've just found that very effective. Um, 
because uh, young people are, you know, very uh, social media savvy um, and are really actually taking their own initiatives in uh, building followings, um, uh, building campaigns, and through just a little bit of support from uh, UNHCR globally, um, we've been able to mobilize these young champions to do a lot of speaking out and, and mobilizing and awareness raising. So that's one idea. Um, you know, a, a, another point is just that young, young people represent um, a very significant voting block. You know, as you, as you were all saying, um, you know, uh, India and, and Africa and some other countries have a very young population. And so when it comes to policymakers, um, you know, thinking about uh, reaching out to young people. And so young people are going to relate to young carers. And so when you're doing your sort of more political advocacy, you know, thinking about policymakers are going to want young people to vote for them. And if you make young carers an issue with young voters, then you can connect those two things and get policymakers um, to prioritize the young carers issue. That's uh, great. Thank you very much, Emma. We're coming to the end of our session now. I just wanted to uh, make a couple of points from the uh, discussion that we've heard so far and the presentations as well. Thanks once again, Emma. Um, I think uh, from Emma, we actually heard a tremendous amount of wisdom, particularly actually the example that she gave from the Human Rights Watch experience, which uh, touched me uh, deeply, actually. and. Um, and uh, the way in which you have to time your work so as to grab the legislature at the right point seemed to me to be very interesting. Um, Stacy gave us um, uh, some very important commentary, but I think the tips were very helpful. And, um, and they were particularly helpful because they were so straightforward and practical. Uh, and that seems to me to be uh, at the heart of um, good advocacy in many ways. Uh, such matters as identify your audience, but it kind of feels self-evident, but then many people don't do that in advocacy or don't do it well enough. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, it's very important. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of speaking the language of the people that you're dealing with, again, is really important, I think. And, and that, of course, also means getting into their culture, uh, their institutional culture, which I felt was very important. Uh, Bimalji gave us a very accurate and, um, and, and thorough description of the work in which advocacy is taking place on behalf of carers in Nepal. We are grateful to Bimalji for that. Um, and of course, the fact that there is a carers charter now uh, should not be ignored. In fact, you have the carers charter hanging on your door behind, your, behind you. Um, and um, and uh, um, Ruth gave a link earlier, or Michelle gave a link earlier for all of us to sign the, the Carers Charter. We may want to put that link out again, um, but that's a very important uh, matter. And here we come, the politics of the situation in Nepal. We have a new government about to come into place in about three weeks after an election. And they are very hopeful to be able to influence that new government and, of course, the president himself. Natesh G, thank you so much for your presentation and for the impressive work that, that uh, Carers Worldwide itself is doing uh, in uh, the countries that you work, including, of course, India, Bangladesh and Nepal. For me, the photos were incredible. Just to see the activity, the action uh, seemed to me to be wonderful. And as always with me and my colleagues who know me well, will know that the livelihoods aspect of this work uh, is so important and it's so valued, of course, by many of the carers that we work. So, dear friends, we are going to be uh, closing the webinar series for this year and we are opening again in the new year. And we'll, of course, be in touch with you from, with more information on that. Um, and, uh, and I wanted very much to thank each of our speakers in turn. Uh, of course, that's the first thing for us to do, Emma. Stacey, uh, your good self, uh, Bimal Ji, and of course, you, Natesh Ji. Thank you so much indeed. Um, I think that's probably all we need to say right now. And just to say a very warm thank you and uh, wishing you a very good day. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.